Thursday night edition of the Air Tour Sports Podcast, Wednesday morning on the pod feed. Hope everybody's doing well. Hope everybody is having a great day. And it's crazy. We are right around 48 hours or so from the tip off of the second weekend of the NCAA tournament, the Sweet 16. Yet most of tonight's show is going to be almost exclusively, it is going to be. Uh, a lot of coaching carousel stuff. So we have a lot to discuss. Everybody come on in. But when I tell you we have a jam-packed show as it pertains to the coaching carousel, oh, we are loaded. We are talking about Kentucky, where when we last left off, it looked like John Calipari might not be back. Well, guess what? He is back. We're going to discuss what just happened uh, on Tuesday night as Calipari met with his AD and what it means for the program going forward. Louisville. It is a total mess. By the way, I'm wearing Louisville red, apparently. I, it wasn't intentional. You talk about chaos in the streets. We are going to talk about Louisville and what is going on there as Richard Petito, the younger Petito, baby Petito, is now the leader in the clubhouse to get that job. And you think Kentucky is dysfunctional? You ain't seen nothing until you went down to Louisville. We'll also very quickly talk about the interesting dynamic Andy Enfield from USC appears to be the favorite at SMU. Does that have a trickle-down effect with USC opening up as well? A lot of people linking Eric Musselman, the Arkansas coach, to that job. We'll share a little bit of that. And then, after we do all of the coaching carousel stuff, maybe we'll actually preview the Sweet 16. Now, the plan is still to do a Wednesday night preview show. But I will be at the Sweet 16 Media Day tomorrow at Staples Center, Crypto.com Arena, Arizona, Clemson, North Carolina, and Alabama. So not positive that we are going to do a full show tomorrow. We will talk to UConn Sasan Diara in our normally scheduled spot. But figure on top of all the coaching carousel stuff, we will, of course, preview the Sweet 16 games as well. If you have picks, if you have comments, make sure to drop them in the YouTube comment section. Before we get started, first of all, A quick thank you to our Bracket partners, Bracket Fanatics at BracketFanatics.com. Fourth year in a row, we are working with Bracket Fanatics. Love working with Bracket Fanatics. And oh, by the way, we have an updated bracket here as we are now through two rounds of the NCAA tournament. So I just logged into Bracket Fanatics, and I want to give credit to Jonah Rappert, who right now is the leader in the Bracket Fanatics bracket Uh, He has his final four of Purdue, of UConn, of Carolina, and of Marquette intact. uh, Jonah Rappin with 65 total points. K. Dennis right behind him. And then how about my buddy Morse Code, Aaron Morse, uh, a good friend of mine, uh, is in third place in the Bracket Fanatics pool. So thank you to Bracket Fanatics. By the way, for the Sweet 16 and Elite 8 games, we might have a cool promo going with Bracket Fanatics, so make sure to stay tuned. We appreciate their support. Speaking of support, thank you to our partners, BetUS and BetUS Sportsbook. So I've been telling you about BetUS. You want to help Torres. Here's what you got to do. BetUS has the best offer going right now online in terms of any sports book going, okay? So how about this from BetUS? They will match 125% of your first three deposits. If you just click the link in the show description, click the link in our YouTube description. So here's the deal. Let's say you bet all your money on Kentucky on on, on, on Thursday. Did not go well. Go to BetUS, click that link, put 100 bucks in, put 200 bucks in, put whatever. They will give you 125% match. So say you put in 100 bucks, you want to put it on Arizona on Thursday night. They'll give you 125 to play with for free. If you lose that, You can reload a second time and a third time, and they will match it 125% up to three bets, up to $2,000. Love working with BetUS. Appreciate their support. I am so fired up to be with them for March Madness. With that said, listen, we have gone on long enough. There is so much to get into. So let's not waste any more time, and let's get to... The topic of the day. And the topic of the day, listen, when we signed off on Sunday night, we we talked Sunday night, we talked all tournament, but we also talked the chaos at Kentucky with John Calipari. If you listen to Sunday night's show, 
where we last left off. Listen, Thursday happens. We know it's bad. You don't. We don't need to go through what happened. Jack Golke, uh just gulking all over the Kentucky Wildcats. But Thursday happens. Friday it gets kind of quiet. And you think, okay, it's going to be business as usual on Saturday at Kentucky, or going forward at Kentucky. We're going to forget about this. Everybody's going to move on. Then, of course, Saturday morning, my buddy Matt Jones, Kentucky Sports Radio, puts out a tweet that basically insinuates that Mitch Barnhart is really thinking about getting rid of John Calipari. That the money is there, that if this move needs to be made, it could be made. And oh, by the way, it could be made as early as Monday. Well, when we recorded on Sunday night, we found out that Calipari wasn't even in Lexington. He was returning on Monday. Uh, and the assumption is, okay, something big is going to happen on Monday. They're going to meet. It's going to get crazy. Maybe Calipari won't be there. And then Monday happens, and a funny thing comes out. And this is where I want to pick up the story. About Monday midday, we find out that John Calipari has his normal radio show, the final radio show of the year, and that he's appearing on the radio show. So in a situation where 24 hours before, we're 12 hours before, where we woke up on Monday, we weren't even sure if he was going to be the head coach. We find out that he's doing the radio show, that he plans on speaking. And I'll be honest, I listened to a little bit of it. I didn't listen to a ton of it. But what I heard, everything I heard was Calipari was talking and speaking as though he was going to be the next head coach of the, or he was going to be the head coach of the University of Kentucky next year. So the Monday radio show happens. We finally find out on Tuesday that these two sides have met John Calipari with his AD, Mitch Barnhard. And right before I came on here on Tuesday night, we find out that John Calipari is in fact returning to Kentucky after meeting with Mitch Barnhart. So I have a lot of thoughts. Let's dive in. Drop your comments below. We will get to all of them momentarily. But I think my first thought on all of this is that I do think in hindsight, and, and listen, I'm not criticizing anyone's reporting. Matt Jones is a good friend of mine. I don't believe, I don't get the sense that at any point, John Calipari was really in danger of losing his job. That's not criticizing Matt. That's not criticizing anybody else who put it out there. But I just think the way that everything went down, Calipari leaves, Calipari returns, Calipari is allowed to do his radio show. That does not sound to me like a guy that somebody was going to throw their body in the way of it and say, Coach Cal, take off radio today. We need you to come into the office. So I don't know if it was ever as intense as maybe we all thought it was. And I include myself. I'm guilty as charged here. But you know what else this speaks to me about is that, listen, over the last two or three weeks, I have obviously been very critical of John Calipari, critical of him in terms of the SEC tournament loss, critical of him in terms of the Oakland loss. But let me also say this. You know what this also says to me? What this says to me is that there is chaos in the athletic department beyond John Calipari. What do I mean by that? Well, first of all, let me say this. Mitch Barnhart, at the end of the day, you can like him, you can hate him, you can agree with his policies, you can disagree with his policies, whatever. He is still John Calipari's boss. And I don't believe that he should have let John Calipari do that media availability unless, until something came out of his office, if there were reports out that John Calipari might be let go, okay? If if you're going to let John Calipari do that media availability on Monday night, I think you have to put out a statement beforehand so there's no confusion. I'm not going to blame John Calipari on that. He's going through business as usual. You can agree with how he conducts his business, but at the same time, he's going about it as business as usual. And as the AD, as his boss, it's your job to do one of two things. To either sit there and say, sorry, Coach Cal, you're not going to do radio until we talk. Or what I think Mitch Barnhart actually probably should have done was put out a statement basically saying that John Calipari is the head coach of Kentucky basketball. What he should have done before he allowed Calipari to take that mic without anybody knowing what Calipari's future was. What he should have done is put out a statement. It didn't have to be complicated. It could have been simple. 
All you got to say is as follows. We're all disappointed with how this season ended. This is not the Kentucky standard. I know there's frustration, but at the same time, John Calipari is our coach going forward, and we plan on meeting later in the week. But to draw, to stop any confusion, to stop any chaos around the program, John Calipari is our head coach. That did not happen. And so John Calipari goes into that media availability not knowing if he's the head coach. I assume he probably knew. But we're all listening. We're all wondering, like, is he going to approach this like he's going to be the coach next year? So it happened that way. And I think Mitch Barnhart, as his boss, needs to step in and do something. And I was texting with a couple of Kentucky fans on Monday night. And I think that's the sentiment here. And for people who don't know the inner workings of Kentucky, I don't blame you if you don't. But at the same time, these two do not get along. And they do not speak. And I'm not saying it's right. I'm not saying it's adult. Uh, as I joked on my buddy John Neighbor's show, he's a radio host in Arkansas. I said, you know, this is like grumpy old men, Walter Matthau and uh, the other guy, whatever his name was, Bob Lemon or whatever, something Lemon. Like they're just grumpy and they're mean and they don't like each other. But Mitch Barnhart, you're John Calipari's boss. It is your job to call him into your office and say, we need to talk. Or it's your job to put something out so your fan base knows what to expect. Now, in terms of the decision to bring him back, listen. I had a lot of people ask me once it became official. I am not here to say what is right and wrong, okay? We don't know the exact parameters of John Calipari's contract. We don't know if really buying him out was realistic. What I would say is I do believe, and I said this the night of the Oakland game, I said I do believe it's probably best for everybody to move on. I'm not saying that Cal is the worst coach that has ever coached to Kentucky. He had a great 10, 12, 15-year run, okay? But the last three, four, five years are not up to the Kentucky standard. And so my concern with bringing him back is pretty straightforward. I don't really think anything's going to change. They have a six-man recruiting class already signed up for next year. Now, maybe you get lucky and Reed Shepard says business not finished. Maybe you get lucky and a DJ Wagner or somebody else doesn't have the draft stock that they think they have and they decide to come back. But even then, you got six freshmen. They're not all going to play. So like, even if you're bringing back some veterans, you're still going to be relying on freshmen. Now to me, and I talked about this on the show last on Thursday, on Sunday, I'm not as worried about the freshmen as everybody else is because the freshmen got you second place in the toughest SEC ever. But it is clear that some kind of change probably needs to happen. Calipari reference, bringing in a defensive coach, somebody, you know, getting the defense back up to their standard, but it doesn't change the fact that it just, it does feel like it's run its course. Now, what I will also say a couple other things, I think it probably would have been best for everybody. If John Calipari had moved on, if, if they had moved on from each other, but Cal was never resigning. By the way, if you go back to the tweet I put out on Thursday after they lost to Oakland, I said, it'd be best if John Calipari resigned. Why did I use the term resign? It's because I know he is way too stubborn, way too stubborn to ever actually step aside. So I knew that was not going to happen. And so because I knew that wasn't going to happen, I said, well, the, the, you know, you got to resign at that point. It's not going to happen. But what I will also say is this. As frustrated as Kentucky fans are, I think there are two things that you do need to consider in terms of Calipari coming back. One. I don't think Mitch Barnhart, the AD, was ready financially or mentally, and we talked about this, to do a coaching search the day of the Oakland game, okay? I think he woke up the day of the Oakland game. He said, we're going to win this. I don't love Cal. We don't get along, but we're going to get through this, and hopefully we can make a little run. No one expected to lose to Oakland. And so when you lose to Oakland, what I truly believe happened was, I just think it was scramble mode, fire drill. I can't believe this is happening. And so one, Mitch Barnhart, first off, he's got to raise that, that whatever the amount is that you have to pay John Calipari tomorrow if you fire him, okay? That's one. Two, and this is the important part. You got to make sure somebody's going to say yes. You got to make sure that if Scott Drew's your number one guy, that he's going to say yes. If you think you can get Jay Wright, you got you you can't wait a week until the tournament's done and Jay Wright's done it with CBS if you think you can get him. And you could debate whether he's a real candidate or not. That's not the point of this conversation. 
the point I'm trying to make, it sucks in the moment for Kentucky fans because I think everybody, even the, the, the biggest cow supporters, were basically ready to move on after Oakland. But the counter to that is, if you can't, if you don't know you're going to get a yes, I don't think it's the worst thing to bring them back for another year. You're going to get some of the guys from this year's team back. The freshman class is going to be really good. The Travis Perry kid was a, just won a state championship at Rupp Arena this past weekend. Carter Knox is good. Boogie Fland is good. Jaden Quaynes is good, et cetera. Not saying they're going to be as good as this year's group, Reed Shepard, all that. But maybe you get one of those guys back. Maybe get a couple of them back with this freshman class. What I do think will happen, I think Mitch Barnhart is going to spend the next 360 plus days waiting to see what happens in the 2025 tournament. And if it goes the way this NCAA tournament went, then yes, I do think John Calipari will be out after next year. And I think Mitch Barnhart will be prepared for it after the NCAA tournament next year. We compared it a few days ago to the Jimbo Fisher situation. Jimbo Fisher, two years ago, it hasn't been great, but he goes, you, you think he's going to be okay. He goes five and seven, and nobody at AM was prepared for that. Then you know what they did? They gave him that offseason. He hired Bobby Petrino, but the second it went sideways, the money was in line. They were ready to do the search, and you can agree or disagree that Mike Elko is the right guy. I like Mike Elko, but they had a plan in place, and I just don't think that plan was there. So we'll see what happens, but John Calipari is back. I see the YouTube chat is just going bananas right now. Uh, I will get to some of your comments later, um, but as far as the Calipari stuff, I, I can't sit here and lie and say that I'm totally surprised that he's back. I think once we got to Monday midday and he's doing his radio availability, I think it became pretty obvious he was coming back. I don't. I, I think it probably would have been best for everybody if he moved on, but I also don't think. It's the worst thing. All right, producer Matt, why don't we go ahead, take a quick word from our partners. We'll come back and then we will talk the other insanity in the coaching carousel because you talk about a mess. There is no bigger mess than Louisville right now, which might be bringing a Patino in, but not the Patino any Louisville fans want. Quick break. Be right back. America's favorite sportsbook and casino. Live betting and racebook. We're celebrating 30 years with a historic offer. A 125% sign-up bonus on your first three deposits. Plus 10% gambler's insurance. Get started today. Bet US, where the game begins. All right, everybody. I am back. Gonna be back, gonna be back. So, we just talked a ton of Kentucky. We will get to some of your questions and comments after. But the chaos at Kentucky, as crazy as it is, it pales in comparison to the craziness right across the street, right across the road at the beautiful Yum Center in Louisville. Because Louisville, unless something has happened in the last 30 minutes since I came on air, Louisville is very much still looking for a basketball coach. And you think the that you think there's a mess at the University of Kentucky? I am here to tell you it is a thousand times worse at Louisville. So when we last left the Louisville situation, so the Louisville situation is crazy. So we've talked about this, I think as much as any show, but Scott Drew, I think was a legitimate candidate at one point. I think he more than took a phone call at Louisville. Okay. Um, you don't get him. You don't get Dusty May. Then we find out uh, on, <laughs> on Saturday that Dusty May isn't coming. And it started to feel like a little bit of a scramble drill, okay? First, we hear Shaheen Holloway, Amir Abdurrahim from USF, South Florida, and of course, on top of that, Pat Kelsey. Then we wake up and we hear on Monday, could it be Josh Schertz, the head coach at Indiana State, just led them to a 28-29 win season. Then the story of the day on Tuesday. From uh, from uh, Jody Demling, who's covered Louisville forever. Then you see Pat Forty tweeting about it. Then you see Jeff Goodman tweeting about it. Is it possible that Louisville is about to hire a Petito, but not the Petito any Louisville fans want? We'll be talking about Richard Petito. Is Richard Petito really about to be the next head coach at Louisville? I don't know, but I will tell you if that is how this ends. I think this could be one of the most disastrous, 
decisions that we have ever seen on the coaching carousel. Okay. So let's go ahead and dive into why that would be disastrous. First of all, I'm not rooting against Richard Patino. I don't know him. Everybody who does says like greatest guy in the world, like just a good guy. Everybody likes him. Easy to get along with whatever. But I am here to tell you, unless Louisville isn't nearly as good of a job as I thought it was, there is nothing on that guy's resume that makes me believe that he should be the Louisville head coach. Okay. He has been a head coach for 12 years in college basketball. He got eight years at Minnesota, two NCAA tournaments. Now, admittedly, Minnesota is a very hard job. I'm not here to criticize him because he wasn't getting the final fours at Minnesota, but two years at or eight years at Minnesota, uh, a, a 534 winning percentage, 141 and 123, 54 and 96 in the Big Ten. He gets fired after the 2021 season. This was his third year at New Mexico. I actually think they were pretty good. But as we found out, they got into the tournament only after winning the Mountain West tournament. So if they don't win the Mountain West tournament, we are talking about going 0 for 3 at New Mexico in the NCAA tournament. They get in, credit to him. But if you look at this guy, there is just nothing on that resume that indicates that he should be the Louisville head coach. And so what this says to me, is kind of exactly what I just said at Kentucky, only it's heightened even more. This, to me, is not a byproduct. I don't blame Richard Pitino. I don't even blame Kenny Payne. What I blame is an administration that is very clearly scrambling and very clearly does not know what it's doing, or at least publicly does not appear to know what it is doing, okay? So for people that aren't following, okay? This is the timeline at Louisville. I think all along, Scott Drew was the pie in the sky. Can we make it happen? As I've said on this show before, my understanding is it was more than a quick phone call. It was more than Louisville calling and Scott Drew saying, I'm good. Don't even, you know, or calling his agent and his agent saying Scott's not interested. I think it got a little further than that, but very clearly Scott Drew wasn't interested. I think at that point, it was pretty obvious Scott Drew was the pie in the sky. But okay, if Scott Drew says no, Dusty May, no doubt about it, is 100% going to say yes. Well, what ends up happening as Dusty May says, uh, getting all sorts of weird texts here, forgive me. So Dusty May, very clear. So so let me even backtrack. Scott Drew says no. Well, that's okay because we got Dusty May in the can. If Scott Drew says no, we'll hire Dusty May. We'll throw a parade, whatever. As I discussed on Sunday, I don't think anyone in that administration, or at least Josh Hurd, ever took the time to consider that Dusty May might say no. I'll take it a step further. I truly believe in my heart of hearts, Dusty May was always their favorite if Scott Drew said no. I don't know if Louisville was ever Dusty May's favorite. And so since that happened, it is so obvious that there was no backup plan. And so to me, that speaks to incompetence from Josh Hurd, the AD. And it's a level of unacceptability at Louisville. And by the way, let me say this. I know I used to work for KSR. I know I did it or whatever. I feel bad for Louisville fans. Listen, I grew up. Louisville was awesome. Louisville was one of the best programs in college basketball, okay? And so I only bring it up. This should never be the way that it is right now. And it speaks to a level of incompetence. Kenny Payne, listen, was not the right hire. But as we're now seeing, maybe it's a little bit more chaotic behind the scenes at Louisville than we realize. Maybe it's not all Kenny Payne's fault that his team stunk. Okay, now it's still a lot of Kenny Payne's fault. Anyway, I bring it up because just look at the situation. And this to me falls on the AD. One, an AD always has a plan. You always hear the great ADs. They have a list in their desk of two, three, four names for every job on their campus that they oversee. We read the stories. Chris Lowe was covering that Nick Saban retirement. Greg Byrne has had a list in his desk for years that he's constantly updating and tweaking and evaluating. And Kalen DeBoer got on there in the last year. But when Nick Saban made that announcement, he was ready to talk to Mike Norvell, Sark, and Kalen DeBoer, obviously. And so if you're Josh Hurd, there's not an excuse that your number one choice said no, but really your real number one choice that you thought you were going to get said no. You have to have a better plan. But then let me take it a step further. 
you have to, one, know who could actually say yes. So the Shaheen Holloway stuff, we'll see if it happens. As soon as I heard that, what did I say on Sunday's show? I said, does he really want the job? Or is he trying to leverage his alma mater to get more NIL money? And oh, by the way, they're still in the NIT. So if you're going to interview him, you better make sure he says yes, because they might not be able to do the introductory press conference for another four or five days. Another thing, if Josh Schertz, the Indiana State coach, is your guy, I'm not saying it's right or wrong. I actually think he's a better candidate than Richard Pitino was a successful, highly successful D2 head coach, multiple Final Fours, gets to Indiana State. They're awesome in year two, should have been in the NCAA tournament. But I only bring it up because if that's your guy, have confidence, have faith, go to the podium, say, this is our guy, this is who we wanted all along. But you can't flip-flop, you can't waffle, you can't this, you can't that. And now it's chaos in Louisville. I don't think Richard Pitino is the answer. I don't think he has a resume warranting being the Louisville head coach. And then let me take this another step further. Is that you talk about just problems at Louisville. You know what was trending on Tuesday afternoon? On Twitter, Jurich. You know who Tom Jurich is? He's the former AD. And so this goes back to what I talked about on Sunday's show. For whatever reason, well, I know the reasons. Louisville obviously has a checkered past, a checkered background, a checkered whatever. We know about the NCAA investigations, and I don't care. I'm not, this is not poke at Louisville time. But it's clear that they are not taking anyone with any sort of quote unquote baggage at a previous stop. Now, I think Will Wade is a guy you should call. Will Wade won an SEC championship at LSU. He can win big ACC championships immediately at Louisville. But you're not going to call him. Um, Eric Musselman, we'll get to him in a minute with USC because that's kind of interesting. But Eric Musselman does not appear to be a candidate. I don't understand why. Jerome Tang does not appear to be a candidate. I don't understand why. But all this speaks to, from me, in my opinion, is utter incompetence. You cannot wait. You cannot waffle. You cannot wonder. You have to have answers and you have to be ready to go. If Richard Pitino gets the job, I wish him nothing but the best. It's good for my business if Louisville is good at basketball. Okay? Louisville is the biggest college basketball market in America in terms of ratings and interest and whatever. A lot of Kentucky fans, a lot of Louisville fans. But I just don't believe he's the guy. But I just don't like the process that led to us getting here. So we'll see what happens with Louisville. But you just talk about a process that has truly, truly been chaotic. I have never seen one quite like Louisville. Let's switch gears. I do want to get to one more coaching carousel kind of update news and note type piece of news. And interestingly enough, where I want to talk right now is the SMU coaching job and the potential trickle-down effect of the SMU coaching job now being available. Why is that? Well, the SMU job has been fascinating. It's been linked to a ton of people. Eric Musselman late last week was linked to that job, the Arkansas head coach. Don't know how far they got. Don't know if it ever got serious, but there was probably Thursday, Friday. It started to feel like he might be the favorite and he might get that job. By the way, I should mention SMU, of course, is headed to the ACC next year. We know about the money that those boosters have. We know they are taking $0 in TV revenue for the next seven or eight years, whatever it is, to be a part of the ACC, okay? And so I bring it up because SMU, they are ready to spend money on a big name coach. Eric Musselman was late last week. I got a text on Sunday. If AM loses, could Buzz Williams be a candidate there? So I bring it up because they're going after big names, but the name that emerged on Tuesday morning, Pete Thamel put out a report that Andy Enfield, the head coach at USC, right down the road from where I'm sitting right now had emerged as the favorite as the head coach. Now, we're recording here 8.36 Eastern time. As best I can tell, nothing has changed in that search. But producer Matt, why don't you pop up the second tweet? I forgot to call for the first one because it's funny. I was driving around on whatever it was, Tuesday afternoon, and I was listening to local sports talk radio, 
and Rodney Pete, who hosts, who hosts Rogan and Rodney, uh, 570 Fox Sports Radio in L.A. He They open their show at 3 Eastern, noon Pacific. Rodney Pete, who played at USC, I believe he won a Heisman Trophy, you know, first round pick, now hosts radio in L.A. They came on the new, they came on with breaking news. And what Rodney Pete said was, I'm not a newsbreaker, but I am here to tell you, Andy Enfield has accepted the job. It might not be official yet. We might not know all the details yet, but Andy Enfield is set to be the next head coach at USC. Matt, you could drop that tweet. Thank you for your help there. I appreciate you. And here's the thing. I'm here to tell you, it wasn't one of those, you know, hey, I'm hearing this might be. No, no, no. They had the breaking news sound alarm and they went hard. There was no doubt that Rodney Pete, he's not a reporter, but he is reporting. It is done. What he basically said was they're trying to figure out the buyout. How much is SMU going to pay? Is USC going to lower the buyout to let Andy Enfield go? And I will tell you, if Andy Enfield goes to, to, to SMU, USC becomes a fascinating coaching job that has now become available. And the question becomes, why is that? Well, on the one hand, it just became, first of all, I think Andy Enfield gets a bad rap. He's a guy, listen, USC basketball is irrelevant, okay? He's been there 11 years. They've been to five NCAA tournaments. They would have had six if the 2020 tournament had been played. One year, they were uh, the first team left out. So they basically went to seven NCAA tournaments in 11 years, take out his first two years when he was rebuilding in the pre-portal era when he actually had to rebuild with freshmen. Basically, seven of his last nine years, they were a tournament team, okay? So I think he gets a bad rap. But why would he want to go? Well, it's because, let's do some math here. USC is a pretty good program in the Pac-12. Well, as of the end of this NCAA tournament, the Pac-12 does not exist. And so remember, USC is going to the Big Ten. And I can tell you, there is trepidation within that athletic department about going to the Big Ten and about USC basketball's ability to compete. Remember, USC does not get good crowds. They struggle to bring in fans. And so on the one hand, you now have 10 road games across the country. You have 10 road games across the country in great venues. And we make fun of the Big Ten uh, basketball on this show, but Purdue's a tough place to play. Michigan State's a tough place to play. Um, whatever. Indiana's a tough place to play. Wisconsin's a tough place to play. Iowa's a tough place to play. Rutgers is a tough place to play. But also keep in mind, when those teams come to L.A., there's going to be more Michigan State fans at the Galen Center when Michigan State's there. There's going to be more Michigan fans when Michigan's there. There's going to be more Ohio State fans when Ohio State fans are there. And so I think that that current staff kind of understands like maybe it's just time for us to do something else. Now to the point that many of you probably want to know if Andy Enfield officially accepts that job. And again, I'm going off a report, but it was not a report that they backed down from. The reports are that Andy Enfield is taking the SMU job. And I do wonder what happens at USC and specifically the name that everybody wants to know. Would Arkansas head coach Eric Musselman be interested in that job? Now, by the way, I had a bunch of Kentucky fans. I hope Cal takes the, the USC job. I, I, maybe they make the call. I don't see it. But I do think Eric Musselman is a legitimate candidate, and I do think that is a job that he would covet and want. Question is why? Well, first of all, he's a West Coast guy. Remember, where was he before he came back to college? He was a pro coach on the West Coast. Head coach, Sacramento Kings. Head coach, Golden State Warriors was at Nevada as the head, head coach in his first uh, uh, college head coaching job. His mom still lives in the San Diego area. I remember, uh, I think Arkansas is scheduled to play a, 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 a Thanksgiving tournament in San Diego. He talked about how excited he is. He'll play in front of his mom. I think last year or two years ago when they played either in Vegas or San Francisco in the NCAA tournament, it was the first chance his mom got to see him coach a game. I could be making that last part up. But I think he would be interested in coming to Los Angeles to coach that program. And let me tell you this. If I was Jen Cohen, the AD, I'll be blunt. That is absolutely freaking lootly a guy that I would want 
as my head coach. The question, why, why is that? Well, what did I just say? USC, USC men's basketball has zero juice in the city, okay? People say LA is a bad sports town. LA isn't a bad sports town, but you have to put a good and interesting and competitive product on the floor to make them interesting. Juju Watkins and USC sold out, I think, their, their, their round of 32 game at Galen Center on Monday night. USC football, we make fun of Lincoln Riley. That place was packed to the gills to start the year. But USC basketball needs some juice, and USC basketball needs someone to make them relevant in the city, and I think Eric Musselman would do that. Now, the question is, would USC hire him? That's the interesting part that I don't really have an answer to. We just talked about it with Louisville. When your job opens or when you think your job is going to open, you have to have a list of candidates in your back pocket. You have to know who you can get and who you can't get. But USC is an interesting deal because I do think they're somewhat limited. And I think there's some names that are not going to be on their list. We talked about with Louisville a minute ago. Louisville is not going to hire anybody that has any sort of off the court baggage. I'm not saying Jerome Tang does. I'm not saying Eric Musselman does. But something has come up in that search where it doesn't feel like they're candidates. Well, USC has a lot of off-the-court, off-the-field stuff that has happened the last couple of years at that school. Remember, this was the place that was part of the FBI college basketball recruiting scandal. Um, Whatever. Don't care. couple kids got a couple hundred bucks. I don't care. But it doesn't change the fact they were part of it. Remember, the admissions scandal. Remember Aunt Becky? Remember Aunt Becky was moving mountains to get her daughter into school there? Oh, by the way, don't forget the previous AD at USC got fired for what was essentially alleged, and I think the, the investigation is still going on. So you heard what I said, alleged sexual harassment. I'm talking about Mike Bone, the guy that came from Cincinnati, the guy who hired Lincoln Riley. And so USC has been very careful in who they've hired in their head coaching you know, past. Remember, there were reports that Urban Meyer wanted that football job. And Carol Folt, who's the school president, basically said from the beginning, there is no way, no how we are hiring Urban Meyer as our head football coach. Now, Urban Meyer had some real baggage. I mean, we're talking about, you know, we know how it ended at Ohio State. We know about the off the field issues at Florida. And Coach Musta, his credit, there's no, there's nothing off the court that would concern you. But we know he's a demanding, and, and I love Coach Musk. Okay, let me let me make that clear. Been great to me. He's a great coach. I I would hire him in a heartbeat. I'm, I think Arkansas made one of the great hires of the last ten years hiring that guy. And oh by the way, guy made three Sweet Sixteens, two Elite Eights at Arkansas. Like, unless something crazy happens, he's going to have more wins in the NCAA tournament than any other SEC team in the last four or five years this year. So anyway, I'm going on and on. The only point I'm trying to make. He's a demanding coach, you know, demands excellence, demands everything. And I don't know if that personality, I would hire him. I'm just saying. But I don't know if that personality would jive with the administration that's there. Jen Cohen, remember, is the new AD. She came from Washington. She hired Kalen DeBoer at Washington. Um, she has not made a major hire at USC. So I don't know what her thought process is. Again, Carol Folt, the school president. She's more hesitant. She's not going to, to just make the first big hire, whatever. So I bring it up. I do believe that Eric Musselman would be interested in that job if it were available. I don't know if USC would be interested. I think they should be, but it'd be fascinating to see who they get. And I'll tell you this, whoever gets that job, if Andy Enfield leaves, is going to have their work cut out for them because it is not going to be an easy place to win. So we got a lot of questions in the chat. Um, I'll tell you what, we'll get to some of them in a minute. Here's the deal. I don't, it feels a little, I, I don't want to say it's early to preview the Sweet 16, but at the end of the day, I don't know if I'm going to be able to do a show tomorrow because I'm going to be at the West Regional Media Availability. So let's just quickly rip through some of these games. We are already 40 minutes into this show. We got hundreds of people in the live chat um, and I got to get to some of these questions. Let's go ahead and get to, uh, first of all, some Sweet 16 games. All odds provided by BetUS Sports. Well, I'm going to give you my quick thoughts, and then I do want to get to some questions. Producer Matt, have two or three ready to go because I, I, I think the chat is humming right now. 
All right, so let's start with the Thursday games. Uh, Los Angeles, the games that I think I'll be at. I'll definitely be at the media availability tomorrow. Clemson against Arizona. Arizona, a seven and a half point favorite. Two seed versus six seed in the early game in Los Angeles. Let me just say this. I think this one's close. Uh, Arizona is a seven and a half point favorite in the Bet US Sportsbook. And the bottom line, what I would say really quickly is this is I get that Arizona is a really good team. They are going to have a huge home court advantage. The number of Arizona fans, I don't think people realize how much they will pack crypto.com arena slash Staples Center on Thursday night. But Clemson is one of these veteran teams. They're not afraid of anything. And remember this with Clemson. Think about who they beat in the non-conference. They beat Alabama at Alabama in the non-conference. They beat South Carolina. They beat Boise State, who made the tournament. They beat UAB, who made the NCAA tournament. They are battle-tested. They're veteran. They took care of Baylor the other day. It's hard for me to pick against Arizona, but remember, Arizona, we've talked about it since the bracket came out. Ebbs and flows, peaks and valleys. You know, a team that had a 17-point lead in the first half against Dayton in the round of 32 and then immediately gives up a 10-0 run to Dayton. So my hunch is Arizona wins. I like Clemson plus the points. Give me Arizona. I'll say 81 Clemson 77 in that one. Second game in LA. Interesting one. North Carolina versus Alabama. The one versus four. That part of the bracket ends up kind of staying as planned. North Carolina only a four point favorite in the Bet US sports book over under 173 and a half. I got to be honest. North Carolina, I feel like, is not getting any respect in this NCAA tournament. Remember, they were only a four point favorite against Michigan State in the round of 32. And they ended up winning convincingly going away. Now, what's interesting here, the over-under of 173. Basically, everybody thinks this is going to be a shootout back and forth high scoring. I think UNC wins going away. Listen, Alabama, I've said it consistently. I think they've overachieved this year. I respect the hell out of what Nate Oates did throughout the season. But I think it's a tough ask of him against this North Carolina team. One, Alabama, I know for a fact, has stayed on the West Coast. They played in Spokane. Their, Their game ended late Sunday. They just flew to Los Angeles on Monday. So they've been on the road at this point for about eight, nine days. If you go back to last week, now you got to play a Carolina team. That's really good defensively sound. And, and, and that Alabama game against Grand Canyon could have gone either way. So I just like North Carolina. I like them versus, you know, against the spread minus four. I just think that number is way, way, way too low. Give me Carolina to win that one. I do think it's a little bit more high scoring. I think it's because of their defense. I'll say Carolina 88, Alabama 80, Carolina and Arizona in the Sweet 16. Let's go to Boston, the early game. Did you see Dan Hurley all pissed off with Matt Norlander? Basically, they uh, Matt Norlander told Dan Hurley, hey, you got the early game on Thursday. So that's disrespect. Everybody's against us. It's us against the world. UConn, an 11-point favorite against San Diego State, a rematch of last year's national championship. Listen, this isn't what I'm going to bet. San Diego State is tough. They're a veteran team. They got a bunch of dudes on that team. Uh, Lamont Butler, Jaden Lede, uh, who, of course, were part of that national championship game run a year ago. But I don't know that they got enough horses. And the thing with UConn, I keep going back to, the way I think you have to beat UConn, you have to be able to put the ball in the basket. St. John's in the Big East tournament put up 90-plus points. That game was competitive. Creighton put the ball in the basket against UConn. I don't believe that San Diego State can do that at a high enough clip. The question is, is their defense going to be good enough to slow down UConn? Lamont Butler is probably the best defensive guard in college basketball. I don't know. I assume he's probably going to take Tristan Newton. I think this one's low scoring. I think UConn wins. I'll say like 70 to 59 feels about right. So right on the number, I will not be betting it. I do have UConn winning. And then the late game. It's going to be fascinating. Illinois, Iowa State, Iowa State, a one and a half point favorite. Listen, the advanced analytics tell you that basically since, you know, probably the last month or so, Iowa State, the best defense in college basketball, Illinois, the best offense in college basketball. Listen, I learned my lesson with St. Mary's last week. If you, if it's offense versus defense, give me offense every time because, 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 you know, it's just a lot to ask to stop a team for again, 48 or for 40 straight minutes. And I just think Illinois is playing at a truly elite level. I've said from the beginning, I think Illinois, and I did say Auburn as well. So I can't really not take credit for that. But I think Illinois could give UConn problems in the Elite Eight. Remember, Terrence Shannon Jr. is playing like the best player in college basketball right now, right alongside Zach Eady. 
30 points against Duquesne on Saturday, 26 in the opener against Moorhead State, uh, 34 versus Wisconsin, 40 in the Big Ten semifinals. I mean, you're talking about over the last five games, he's had at least 28 points. He's averaging about 33, 34 points per game. Insanity. I like Illinois to win that game. And they got other guys too. Um, Marcus Tomashek. I always trip over his name. Coleman Hawkins. I just think they give Iowa State a lot of problems. I think size, I think UConn size could give Illinois problems. I don't think Iowa State has that. Really quickly, let's get to the Friday games. Uh, let's go to the early ones. Bet US Sportsbook, the first tip on Friday. Marquette versus NC State. Listen, NC State's an incredible story. Marquette's a six and a half point favorite in this one. Won't be betting this one. I think Marquette wins. Shaka Smart, by the way, quietly got a monkey off his back. You know, Shaka Smart had not been to the second weekend of the NCAA tournament since his 2011 Final Four run. So Shaka, I think that monkey's off his back, but but Marquette tends to play close games, and they're so they're really good, but they're not good enough to just blow teams out. They just don't have the size. They have the skill at the guard position, but you give NC State four or five days, I think this one's close. Remember, Marquette, uh, they actually trailed at halftime against Western Kentucky in the opener. They ended up winning going away, but they did trail at the half. And then they beat Colorado by four. Wouldn't surprise me if NC State pulls off the upset, goes to the Elite Eight. Maybe we get some Kemba Walker type magic. Remember Kemba, five wins in five days at the Big East Tournament. Then they go on to win the national championship. Uh, but I do think that um, I do think that Marquette wins the late game. In that Midwest regional is of course um, is of course Duke Houston. Duke Houston is the late game there. Houston a four point favorite. Listen, I actually like Houston. I think what is happening in this game, I think it has swayed too much. To Duke looked awesome, so we are going to um, so we're gonna we're gonna fade Houston and Houston struggled against Texas A and M. Remember Duke with due respect, they're a four seed. They played, what, a 13 seed and a 12 seed to get to the Sweet 16. I'm not disrespecting, but I do think the love is probably a little bit too much. And then Houston, they played a power conference team. Texas A&M was a preseason top 15 team. They played Texas A&M in the out-of-conference. And so because of it, I just tend to think that that Houston, uh, Texas A&M is going to play them about as tough as anybody. I think Houston wins this game. I'll say 72-60, to 60, Houston advances. And then in the Midwest region, listen, a lot of people seem to think Gonzaga has a shot. I just don't see it. They have bigs, but they're either really short like Graham E.K. or they're really skinny like Braden Huff. I think Purdue rolls. I think it's another 30 and 20 for Zach Eady. This could be the game, by the way, where Zach Eady, you know, where, where Gonzaga picks up six fouls in the first two minutes and the discourse really begins. But I do think Purdue wins. And I think that second game, Creighton, Tennessee, Absolutely fascinating. I do worry about Tennessee. That game against Texas really did worry me um, because they just couldn't score the ball. And Creighton is a good defensive team. They can put the ball in the basket. I'll actually take Creighton plus the points. I think Creighton wins outright. By the way, Tennessee fans, before you get mad and throw mayonnaise bottles at me and golf balls, I had Tennessee in the Elite Eight. I think they're the best matchup for Purdue in this region. But this game worries me. And I, I think Tennessee really probably has played one really great game out of their last four. They lost to Kentucky in, in the season closer. They lost to, uh, uh, to Mississippi State in the SEC tournament. They rolled in their opener, and then they struggled against Texas. I think Creighton wins. So those are my Sweet 16 picks. Uh, we may do a show tomorrow, kind of more dive in depth. But what I want to do now, do want to go ahead and take a few questions from everybody listening the chat is absolutely insane right now, and I appreciate everybody's support. Producer Matt, throw up a few questions if you can. For producer, do you think Cal, this is from Casey. Casey is, of course, the guy that said that I am the baddest MF for to ever host a college basketball podcast. So Casey, you're my favorite listener. He said, for the producer, do you think Cal will stay stubborn or will lock in this season and be willing to change things up? For example, platoon squads, if he could, because his job is on the line. I think a, a tiger can't change his stripes. And I think especially a 65 year old tiger can't change his stripes. Listen, it's, 
I, Cal's been great to me in my career. I want Cal, I want Cal to end this thing the way it should end, which is either on a high note, a deep NCAA tournament run, a national championship, whatever, or with everyone agreeing that it's time and him getting the proper send off that he deserves. But I don't think that is going to happen because I think he's too stubborn. And so I don't want to be negative. It's March 26th. It's a beautiful March evening here in California where I'm at. We got sweet 16 games in 48 hours from now. But I think it's going to be what it's been the last three or four years. It's going to be one or two weird losses in the out of conference. There's going to be a couple early bad losses in the regular season. Get to the SEC tournament. Maybe you win a game there. By the way, I'm thinking about going to the SEC tournament next year. So I need Kentucky to be good, okay? If Kentucky's good, we're taking this show on the road to the SEC tournament to Nashville. But I need Kentucky to be good. But we got a four or five year track record that this is just how it is. Maybe they win an opening round game, but you got to win a game against somebody who matters. I mean, think about the last four years. Lose to Oakland. The year before, you, you beat Providence, who Ed Cooley was checked the you know what out, was already packing his bags for Georgetown. And then you lose to K State. Year before, you lose to St. Peter's. So I'm hoping it gets better. My hunch is that probably I do think that we're talking about a situation where um, I think the regular season probably exceeds expectations. And I also think, too, the other thing, Casey, I think a lot of it comes down to who are the freshmen that end up coming back. So, you know, who comes back on that roster? Because if you get some of the big pieces back, I think that becomes a very interesting team. I need to see who's back. You know, if it's a Reed Shepard, and a big Z and whoever, then I think Reed Shepard comes back with a chip on his shoulder. He says, let's go win a natty. But if there's no Reed Shepard, if it's kind of that hodgepodge of guys with a bunch of freshmen, I don't know that I feel great. Producer Matt, what else we got? Louisville's problem is they have blue blood history, but they have ACC money, power to world now. So that's a great comment by Damani. Damani says Louisville's problem is they have blue blood history, but ACC money, it's a power to world now. So, Damani, I really like that question. I don't agree with that, though. I don't agree that anybody who's not in the Big Ten or the SEC is just poverty and, and don't even bother showing up. And you know where I think the best example of that is? It's at Louisville. And you know why I feel that way? Who is their football coach right now? Jeff Brom, who was poached from Purdue. Now, I get He's a Louisville guy from the city. Parents, you know, I think his grandfather played there. His dad played there. He coached there. His brother's a legend. I get all that. What I would also say, if the Big Ten was that much better, he would not have come back to Louisville. But I think what he sees is a pathway to the playoff. And I think if you're at Louisville, you can build a national championship contender if you know what you're doing. You know why? Because Hubert Davis did it at North Carolina. Because John Shire has a team in the Sweet 16 at Duke. Because UConn might be the most consistent program in college basketball right now. They're not in the power two. Because Creighton, Marquette, Seton Hall, Rick Pitino chose St. John's. There's other good jobs outside the big two. By the way, you think Bill Self is leaving Kansas for uh, Mississippi State because it did the big two? I don't think so. You think Arizona is a worse job than whatever, uh, uh, Northwestern, because Northwestern's in the big ten? So I get the point, Damani. I think it's a great comment. I'm not criticizing you, but I think we're going a little too far. Now, I do think the money is going to play a difference in like staffing and resources and things like that. But I still think there are really good jobs outside of that big two. I just think Josh Hurd, the AD, has just screwed this thing up beyond belief. I think it's really bad right now. What else we got? Um, if you no 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 the notorious JP says if you had to guess who would you think Louisville has as their ace up their sleeve? I can't help but think there's an unnamed candidate for the job. I, I don't think there is one, and I don't know why that is. And I don't understand what is so bad about the Louisville job that nobody wants it. But but I just think what it is. I just don't think Josh Hurd was ready for Dusty May to say no. And once Dusty May said no, I don't think he had a backup plan, and I think it went into scramble drill mode. And so I don't know. I I'm curious about Shaheen Holloway, because I think Shaheen Holloway, chip on your shoulder, former player, kids love playing for him. But is he does he really want that Louisville job? Or is it one of those deals? Um, 
Is it one of those deals where he's just trying to leverage his own school for more? That's what I am curious about. Is that what's really going on? Um, but I don't know. I mean, I think if you're getting to multiple people reporting that Richard Patino might be the guy, that means that it's probably pretty close, and that means you don't have an ace up your sleeve, and I think that's Louisville's problem. Any other questions, Producer Matt? I know we got a lot of comments. I don't know. Conferences are mattering less and less, I think, when it comes to tournament time. Indiana Sports Connection says that. Um, yeah. I, I mean, listen, I think in football, we will see a clear delineation between the two SEC and Big Ten and everybody else. I don't think it's that way in basketball. By the way, I think the Big 12 strategically made sure that it wasn't going to be that way. They already had Kansas. They already had Houston coming in. They went and got Arizona. You can't you can't talk major college basketball without talking the Big 12. Gonzaga, as long as Mark Few is going to be there, is relevant. They just got a commitment from a really good transfer on, on Tuesday night as we were getting ready to court. Michael Ayayi from, um, from Pepperdine. UConn is in the Big East. Marquette is in the Big East. St. John's, as long as Rick Pitino is there, they're going to be relevant. So I'm actually with Indiana Sports C Connection, and I do think, especially in basketball, you can build outside the power structure. Now, you still need money. You still need resources. I think it's going to be hard for Boston College to build a power. But North Carolina, Arizona, Kansas, um, Gonzaga, UConn, Marquette, you can build a winner and you can build an excellent program outside the power too. And as a matter of fact, I think what we're going to see in the Big Ten I think a lot of those jobs are going to turn into wastelands. I think if Andy Enfield leaves USC and they don't hit a home run, that becomes a very tough job. Um, Northwestern just got harder. Uh, Minnesota all of a sudden is way harder than it was three, four, five years ago. I think even the middle tier jobs, Iowa's harder, whatever. Penn State is harder. So I, I actually think in some ways, the Big East, there's only what, 10 schools, 11 schools? Would you rather be one of 11 where everyone's kind of equal or would you rather be one of 18 where you got to climb up a lot of people in the big 10? Let's keep it going. WTK says, and I hate to admit it, but I agree with him or her. UK will be unimaginably toxic next year with Cal. Like every decision is life or death. That's not fair to the kids. WTK, I hate to say it. I agree with you 100%. And again, I, I I wish Cal, I wish both parties. I don't want to just blame Cal. I wish Mitch and Cal weren't so stubborn and they could get along. And I, do, I don't want the Cal era to end like this, but it is so bad. It is so toxic. Um, and I thought it was this year. And here's the crazy part. This year, it was really toxic. Really, the previous three or four years, it was really toxic. But what was crazy about the Oakland game was that the second that it went final, I had people that were the biggest Cal supporters saying, it's time. We can't keep going on like this. So let's say Cal had 30% of the fan base still in his corner, basically waiting to see how this year played out with the freshman and Reed Shepard and whatever. If you had 30% and you just lost 20 more, 25% more of the small fraction that you had, it's just going to be so toxic. And WTK, I, I hate to admit that you're right. Because again, it, it's fun when Kentucky's rolling and everybody's happy and whatever. But it has been really toxic. And, and you know, it, it, I'm not speaking, you know, anything that people don't know. But I do think that, you know, the last couple of years, it's felt like even within the fan base, there's been division. In other words, I think half Kentucky fans want to see Kentucky lose so Cal will be out. Again, I just wish he wasn't so stubborn. I wish there was a way that that things could end in a better manner um, so that it didn't have to end this way. I just, you know, it, it sucks that this is appears how it's going to be ending. See if we get one or two more questions before we get out of here. For producer, you think Cal Perry, another question from Casey. He says, do you think Cal Perry will... Uh, Rinse and repeat or play hard defense this season. Also, every time UK plays Duke. And I saw this. So this was not something I was aware of. Um, the Champions Classic is the opening weekend, opening, not the opening day, but, you know, the opening week tournament, you know, four game thing with Kansas, Duke, Michigan State, and Kentucky. 
And Kentucky has not had success in this event. Now, this past year, they lost to Kansas, but it was a close game. They could have won. I thought it was a good showing. Next year, they open with Duke. Duke has Cooper flag. Duke's going to get some of these freshmen back that are really good right now. Also, they got the big seven-foot kid from Africa. I don't, I'm not even going to try to pronounce his name, but people are saying he's going to be a top-10 pick. If it goes sideways against Duke in week one, you understand how nasty and mean it's going to get for Kentucky. And Kentucky will lose by 20, Casey says. Everybody will freak out. No, that, that's what it is, is that you're going to be playing Duke. Duke's going to have the number one pick in the draft. And it's going to get really ugly if you lose to Duke in that game. And I think what is Kentucky? Like one in five in the last six Champions Classic. I know the year they had Tyrese Maxey, they beat Michigan State. I think Michigan State was preseason number one that year. But yes, I could see it getting really toxic. And I just, it would have been good for all parties to move on after this one. But it clearly didn't happen. And so now I don't know what's going to happen. Good to hear someone from outside Kentucky properly pronounce Louisville. So, thank you, Joe. Joe says, you know, I, I pronounced Louisville correctly. Here's the thing. I spent a lot of time in Kentucky. Now, I haven't been back in probably three years, four years. But I've spent some time in Louisville. And trust me, I've called it Louisville. And I've gotten crushed for it. I've gotten criticized. I've gotten yelled at. I've gotten the rocks thrown at me. Not quite. But, yes, it's Louisville. And uh, it is funny as somebody who's so immersed in college basketball and college athletics – to hear others pronounce it incorrectly, uh, it is Louisville, the, uh, the the situation that as of right now, as of 9.08 Eastern time, does not have a head coach. Maybe one or two more, and then we will get out of here so we can get some of these clips up on YouTube. Um, if Richard Patino gets the Louisville job, I wonder if Rick will come watch them at the Yum Center. I think he will. Listen, you know, there is a big contingent of Louisville fans right now. They want big Rick energy. By the way, I could sell a lot of my big Rick energy t-shirts. I wouldn't even have to change the color scheme if he leaves St. John's. I, I think Rick is going to retire at St. John's. I think, you know, I think he loves being in New York. It is Rick Pitino going to show up to watch Richard. Who was one of Richard's best players at New Mexico this year? Jamal Mashburn Jr. So imagine Jamal Mashburn Jr. running out of the Yum Center tunnel for Richard Pitino, the head coach, wearing that Louisville red. Imagine him shooting jumpers in the corner at Rupp Arena. Talk about poor Jamal Mashburn. Jamal Mashburn might show up and not know who to root for. I mean, he can't root for Louisville, but he can't root against his son. So that's the part that I don't think enough people are talking about. By the way, drop your question. Go ahead, Producer Matt. You can toss that up there. Now that Juwan Howard has been fired, uh, do you think he will go back to the NBA as an assistant? I do. I do. I, I, listen, I know, I know he's had two or three like violent incidences. But everybody who's been around Juwan Howard likes him. I mean, you know, I, I I shouldn't say, but but I have a lot of mutual friends, and I've never had the chance to talk to him. He doesn't really do a lot of media. Um, but everybody that I know that works with him, that's around him, for the most part, likes him. Now, I think what ended up happening with Juwan Howard was, you know, lost a lot of beelines, guys. I think, you know, he had his two sons in the program, which makes it tough. Um Culture got kind of sideways, but everybody likes him. So, yes, I think he'll get a job with Miami Heat. I think he'll be good to go. Um, I was going to make another comment, but I forget what it was. So, by the way, do we want the full Sweet 16 preview? I think I think what I did is enough. We'll, we'll definitely have Hassan Diara on, which, by the way, I have to speak with him here in a little bit. But um, definitely have Hassan Diara on here in the future. Uh, but I think that'll be it for Thursday. show, And then we'll do a Thursday reaction show. I don't know if I will be live from Staples Center or not. Um, but we will do a live show on Thursday. Producer Matt, anything else before we get out of here? Any last ones? Producer Matt, last question. Portal players. It, the portal's humming, man. I'll just say this. You know, I just did a portal update before we got on air because I knew I was going to have time on the show. Um, Zeke Mayo, the kid from San, uh, South Dakota State, is a stud. I actually think he'll probably end up staying in the NBA draft, but that is a name to know. Michi Johnson, who, of course, was at South Carolina. Um, interesting, he entered the portal. Remember, he started his career at Ohio State, played the last two years at South Carolina, um, enters the portal, and Ohio State's collective quote tweeted his announcement with the eyeball emojis. Um, 
So I don't know if Ohio State's got something up their sleeve or what, but I think it's too early. And I don't, I, I, you know, and, and Cal even said this in that radio availability is I don't think he even knows what he's going to go after because he's got to figure out which players from this year's roster are actually coming back. I think that's a separate Kentucky related thing is who's realistic and who isn't. I've said from the beginning, I think Reed is more likely than not uh, to, I, I, I didn't say that. I said, I think it's at least conceivable that Reed Shepard could potentially return to Kentucky. I don't know if the NCAA tournament loss makes it more or less likely because to Casey's point, to others points, WTK's point, it is going to be very toxic in Lexington over the next year or so. So maybe his parents smartly say, let's just get you to the NBA, get you out of here. Guys, I, I do think I'm going to get out of here on that note. Uh, love listening to you, Aaron. Always keep me updated on everything college basketball. Go BBN, says Cody Smith. Cody, thank you. Um, hate to do it because we got a huge live crowd right now. We got probably close to 2,000 people watching, but I got to get out of here. So do me a quick favor. If you're not subscribed to the YouTube channel, click that little subscribe button at the bottom of the screen. Turn on alerts. We're Listen, we're going full speed ahead with college, ho college hoops because remember, we got Sweet 16, we got Final Four. But the portal is bananas. And I'm telling you, nobody covers the portal like we do. So make sure you're subscribed. Put on those notifications. Um, and I think we're going to get out of here on that note. If you're not subscribed to the podcast, by the way, you want to do Tor as a favor, subscribe to the podcast as well. Uh, make sure it auto updates so that you get the, the podcast right to your phone. But if you're not subscribed to the show, please make sure to do so. Apple, Spotify, Amazon Music, Google Music, make sure you're subscribed there. Also, make sure to rate and review the show. Go ahead, give us a quick five stars. Let us know what you like, what you don't like. Thank you to Indiana Sports Connection. He said, great show, first time listening. I appreciate your support, Indiana Sports Connection. Casey, love you too. Casey was the one. Torres is the baddest mf for that host of College Basketball Podcast. So that was one of the great comments in the history of the show. If you're not subscribed, make sure to do so. Apple, Spotify, Amazon Music, Google Music. Uh, make sure to like and all that good stuff if you want to leave a five-star review on apple that would be appreciated thank you to our partners bet us and bet us sportsbook link in the bio below uh 125 percent deposit bonus on your first three deposits appreciate that um and i'll tell you what we'll be back tomorrow with hassan diara and we will be back thursday recapping a busy night and by the way if anything happens at louisville if anything happens at usc and andy enfield and who knows what's going to happen there We'll be back for all that. Appreciate everybody's support. I'm going to get out of here. Shout out to Torrent Craig. Shout out to Rachel, who hates my voice. Shout out to JJ Reddick, you F-head. Unblock me, JJ. You know who you are. I'll be back tomorrow at some point. If there's breaking news, we'll do something live. Otherwise, we'll be back Thursday night recapping the Sweet 16 games. 